believe, well, just from the things shared by the other speakers thus far, it's obvious that they are. The more pointed question is, of what significance is that eschatologically in terms of prophecy, and what should we do about it? Continue with that in a moment. I've been told by the book table, because a lot of people have been asking, this kind of Bible teaching we have. I have two books here which are transcribed Bible studies, Grain for the Famine and More Grain for the Famine. The Hebrew prophet Amos said in the last days, there'll be a famine for the hearing of the Word of God. And there is a famine. The general level of biblical exposition and expository preaching and things like this have gone down so much in the last 25 years, it's unbelievable. We're doing a prophecy conference. Well, when I was first saved in the early 1970s, if you went to a Christian bookshop, the books shelves would be cluttered with late grade planet Earth type books, books about the return of Jesus, about eschatology. Over 35 years ago, there was far more interest in the return of Jesus than there is now. We are 35 years plus closer to his return, yet there's substantially, noticeably, conspicuously less interest now than there was when I was first saved back in the early 1970s. That is a deception in itself. One of the main deceptions being aimed at the church today is, of course, the purpose-driven agenda. It's openly taught, and I'm only stating a fact by Rick Warren, keep away from end-time prophecy. These things are a diversion. Now, Jesus gave us an orchestrated litany, an elongated list of things to look for, heralding his return and telling us to be alert. He uses the term in verse 14 of Matthew 24 in the Olivet Discourse, be alert. Jesus says, be alert. Rick Warren says, keep away from that. You can either believe the New Testament or you can believe the purpose-driven lie. You can believe the teachings of Jesus or you can believe the teachings of Rick Warren, but you cannot believe both. I'm not attacking the man personally, but his doctrine not only deserves to be attacked, it deserves to be torpedoed because it is misleading God's people. It is dangerous. Keep away from that stuff. Prophecy is getting more important as we draw closer to the return of Jesus. It should be more emphasized, more studied, more focused on now than it was 35 years ago, not less, yet there is far less interest. Turn with me, please, to the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24, Matthew's version of the Olivet Discourse. Verse 3, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, hot as I had team, we say in Hebrew, the disciples came to him privately, saying, tell us when will these things be, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And Jesus, Yeshua, answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, etc., etc. First words out of his mouth. What do we look for? What should we anticipate about your coming? First words out of his mouth. Beware of deception in the church. If we look at the Olivet Discourse, both Matthew 24 and 25, Luke 21, uh, Luke's elements of it in Luke 17 and Luke 11, Mark 13, if we were to look at the Olivet Discourse, the heart of Jesus' teaching on his return, we see that he warns about an increase in wars one time, rumors of wars one time, famines one time, pestilence one time, earthquakes one time, the Jews returning to Jerusalem one time, uh, technically two times, but deception four times. Jesus warned about deception that will be perpetrated against Christians four times more than he warned about anything else as a sign of his coming. If you would have asked me when I was first saved back in the early 1970s why I believed it was the last days, I would have pointed to contemporary events in the Middle East. I would have pointed to the globalization of the world economy. I would have pointed to a lot of things. Well, I still believe those things. In fact, I would even say they're more true now than they were 35, 36 years ago. However, if you ask me today what's the clearest sign of the return of Jesus, it is the magnitude of deception within the body of Christ. I do not mean liberal Protestant denominations or nominal Christian denominations. I mean among churches where the people say they're born again. I mean among preachers who claim to be regenerate, who claim to be saved. Deception among the elect is the clearest sign I can see for the return of Jesus. The very thing he warned about more than anything else. To the ridiculous point, we're, we're being told to keep away from prophecy in direct contradiction to his specific instruction to be aware, to be alert. Four times. 
He says it four times. See to it, no one misleads you. Four times. He goes on, many false prophets will come and mislead many. Four times. Four times. False Christs and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders. Four times. And he says, if possible, the elect will be deceived. Now there in the Greek text, it uses something in Greek grammar. We have it in English, but it's not that important. But in Greek, it's very important. It's called the subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood in Greek implies doubt. It means the theoretical possibility of it exists. Often, the subjunctive mood is designated by the term lest, L-E-S-T, in a translation. You know, when he, t he would tell the Pharisees, lest you see with your eyes and hear with your ears, which we'll look at it in sh shortly. It means, well, it was possible for the Sanhedrin to repent and believe him and get saved. It was possible, but it was not likely to happen. Yet the theoretical possibility exists. Why would he repeatedly warn about something that could not happen? Yet I've heard people during the laughing and drunken deception, which they tried to market as a revival, saying, well, if possible, but it's not possible. Oh, it certainly is possible. Why would Jesus keep warning about something that couldn't happen? But such is the age we live in. Peter explains this and goes to some lengths to explain it in his second epistle. Turn with me, please, to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. For false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Notice Peter uses false teachers and false prophets interchangeably, as if they were synonymous terms. False teachers and false prophets, he uses them interchangeably. Why? If somebody's doctrine is wrong, their prophecies will be wrong. Why do we have a catalog of false predictions made by people, major figures like Rick Joyner, Benny Hinn, Mike Bickle, things we can fully document? Why are there prophecies, predictive prophecies, that are time-specific so often wrong? Not very long ago, less than six months ago, you had a gentleman from Canada who claimed to be born again, and he was a criminally convicted pedophile who was in prison for molesting a seven-year-old boy. He was a homosexual pedophile who claimed to have become a Christian. Whether he did or not, I'm not his judge. But after becoming a Christian, he got married and he had himself covered with tattoos head to toe. He was in Lakeland, Florida, with all kinds of antics, claiming there was a revival. And if you watched it on some of the Christian TV stations or on YouTube, it's still on YouTube, he was saying, in the name of the Father, the Son, and bam, Holy Spirit was bam. In one of his bams, he punches this Chinese gentleman in the mouth and you see the guy's teeth flying. In another one, he kicks an elderly woman in the stomach in the name of the Father, the Son, and bam. And yet a third one, he kicks an old lady in the face in the name of the Father, the Son, and bam. And he kicks her in the face. He made all kinds of healings which were reported on ABC Nightline in this country. ABC Nightline went to the local hospital, the Arnold Palmer Hospital, named after the its benefactor, the golfer, in Lakeland, Florida. And the hospital issued a statement saying, none of these claimed healings can be medically documented. <laughs> Bam. He kicks an old lady in the face. What do you call someone who kicks an old lady in the face? Do you call that assault and battery, grievous bodily harm? In England, they use the term granny bashing. What do you call it? They called it a revival. This is madness. And night after night, the Lord showed me there's a thousand people here going to give a thousand dollars. He'd get the money. This is on YouTube. You can watch it. It's still on there as far as I'm aware. But it was on television and on YouTube. Major figures. Che Ahn from Los Angeles. Bill Johnson from Northern California. C. Peter Wagner, formerly a Fuller Theological Cemetery. And Rick Joyner prophesied over this guy, saying he was going to be the great agent of revival. He was going to lead the great revival. Four days later, he abandons his wife and three children and takes off with a babe to Hawaii. He took the money with them. The day before yesterday, his new wife announces she's been in contact with the ghost of Oral Roberts. 
Why do these people predict these things that don't happen? Why did Peter Wagner get it wrong and Rick Joyner, why, why are they always... Their prophecies are wrong because their doctrines are. We are told in Deuteronomy 28, people who predict things in God's name that are time-specific, which fail to transpire, are false prophets. We are commanded to keep away from them. The founders of Mormonism are proven false prophets. The founders of the Jehovah's Witness cult, proven false prophets. The Catholic nonsense from Fatima, she's a proven false prophet, that nun Lucy. Well, so too are some of the leading so-called evangelical figures. You're judging, you're criticizing. No, it's what God says. In the last days, these people will emerge, false teachers and false prophets, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. That's a very difficult phrase to translate from the original Greek. The word is parasoxusin. Parasoxusin. Para next to, like paramedic, paralegal, something like that. Parasoxusin. They put truth next to error. The way false teachers and false prophets deceive people is they put truth next to error. And you always hear the same story. Well, there's some good in what they say. Well, there's some truth in it. Chew the meat, spit out the bones. If I took some tea, hypothetically, and I put some milk into it and the milk was soured, can I say, I'm just going to swallow the tea and spit out the milk? No, it's homogenous. It's a homogeneous solution. That doesn't work. That's parasoxusin. Think of the Jesus message to Laodicea. If you go to Laodicea, the water comes down from Pamukkala, from the hot springs in a Roman uh, aqueduct. You've got hot springs and cold springs in Laodicea. I've been there many times, but where the two mix, the water is lukewarm. Can you say, I'm going to swallow the cold water and spit out the lukewarm, or I'm going to swallow the hot water and spit out the lukewarm? No. You can't do it. God hates a mixture. The Hebrews were forbidden to even wear a garment of wool and flax. God hates a mixture. By virtue of the fact there's some truth in it, there's always real cheese in a rat trap. The truth is always there to masquerade the error. Look for no good in it. When a Jehovah's Witness knocks on your door, you and I will agree with at least 50% of what they say. It's the other 50% that's deadly. They secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. They deny the real Jesus. In the first edition of her first book in this country, Joyce Meyer taught, unless you believe Jesus went to hell, you can't go to heaven. She got that from Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagin. It all came from two people, E.W. Kenyon and William Branham, people who were excommunicated from mainstream Pentecostalism in the 1940s. They taught Jesus died spiritually, that Satan, not Jesus, got the victory on the cross, that when Jesus died on the cross, he went to hell, mistranslating the word Hades from Greek, and he was tortured three days and three nights in hell. Then he had to be born again in hell. Then he rose from the dead after being one nature with Satan in hell. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. Father, into your hands I give my spirit. Kenyon, Copeland, Hagen, Joyce Meyer, they said the opposite. The victory was not won on the cross. The victory was won in hell, they say. Jesus had to be born again in hell. Because the cross of Jesus is not their view of the gospel, neither is the cross of Jesus their view of the Christian life. Instead of pick up your cross and follow me, it becomes blab it and grab it, name it and claim it. You're a king's kid. God wants you rich, hallelujah. Believe God for that Mercedes Benz. Believe God for that Cadillac. There's no cross in it. That's not their gospel. They secretly introduce destructive heresies. Well, there's some truth in what they say. Of course there is. Camouflage. They secretly do it, but look at verse 2. Many will follow their sensuality. Because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. Sensuality. People who go by their feelings instead of the word of God. That becomes their barometer of spirituality, how they feel about it. Well, I just feel blessed. You weren't blessed, you were deceived. It's not scriptural. Don't tell me that, I know my God and I feel blessed. You have a critical spirit. That's what they say, that's what they're programmed to say. 
Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 tells us something different. The Word of God is living, active, and sharper than a two-edged sword, separating bone from marrow, flesh from spirit. If someone was going to do a erythrocyte, a red blood cell transplant on leukemia patients, you'd harvest the red cells from the marrow of big bones like the femur or the fibia. Bone tissue, osteocytes, dye stains a grayish white. The erythrocytes, the red cells, dye stain like a maroon. But when the two kind of tissue come together, it's like rust colored. Where does the bone tissue end and the blood tissue begin? The red cell tissue. Well, they use a surgical instrument called a surgical micrometer to separate the two. The Word of God is like the micrometer. The relationship between soul and spirit is like the relationship between bone and marrow. Where does one end and the other begin? Was that a real tongue? Was that a real prophecy? Was that a word of knowledge? Or was it just your imagination? We're supposed to use Scripture to determine. Now that word in Hebrews 4.12 that separates flesh from spirit is kritikos in Greek. Kritikos. What does kritikos sound like in English? You have a critical spirit. I certainly hope so. If you don't have a critical spirit, it's not simply that you're going to be deceived. If you don't have a critical spirit, you are already deceived. Now, I don't mean critical in the sense of fault finding. I mean critical in the sense of examining something on the basis of Scripture to find out if it's of God or it isn't. If it contradicts Scripture, it's not of God. It's not real spirituality. But as I warned in our earlier session, today, spirituality is being mimicked counterfeited by sensuality, by mysticism. Exegesis is being supplanted by Gnosticism. And they don't know the difference. Who gets taken in by the false teachers and false prophets, Peter tells us? It is those who are governed by sensuality. Oh, I just feel... I was blessed by watching her. But because of such people, the way of truth is maligned. Maligned. In their greed, they will exploit you with false words. They have a financial motive. Televangelists prostitute the word of God to line their own pockets. I'm of a Pentecostal disposition myself, conservatively or moderately speaking, at least as biblically defined Pentecost. Most of what you see today is not biblically Pentecost or biblically charismata. It is charismania. It's lunacy. It's not of God. The Pentecostal ministry in this country and among my fellow charismatics has too often become a dumping ground for people who can't do anything else. These are largely uneducated people they would not have the intellectual ability to become successful in a trade or a profession or a business. They're not entrepreneurial people. They couldn't be a professor of economics or a successful attorney or an oral surgeon. So they prostitute the Word of God to give themselves a lifestyle and a standard of living they couldn't get otherwise. Knowing how to prey on sensual people. Think of criminals. They're not intellectually clever, but they're streetwise. They know how to play a sucker. Well, the circus magnet, P.T. Barnum, said there's a sucker born every minute. I'm sorry to report, not only was he right, but there's a sucker born again every minute. Unsaved people see right through the antics of these con artists. That's what Peter is warning about. But Peter puts it in an eschatological framework, and the last days it continues. And he tells us, specifically, it'll ultimately come to three things. One, you're going to see some kind of demonic incarnation again. Jesus said, not as in the days of Noah, but he was emphatic, just as in the days of Noah. We can speculate, without using much imagination, how biogenetic engineering in the hands of fallen man can result in something demonic. I've been warning about that for nearly 20 years. Second thing he talks about is radical homosexuality, the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah and the rescue of Lot, a righteous man, and the rescue of Noah. The rescue of Lot and the rescue of Noah are both types, shadows of the rapture. As the rapture approaches, as the rescue approaches, 
we see more and more people pulling further away from it, being deceived by false teachers and false prophets. Well, let's go further with this. I take it most of you have talked to Jehovah's Witnesses when they come to the door. If you know the scriptures even reasonably well, you can paint them into a corner. If you know the scriptures very well, you can manipulate them into painting themselves into a corner. A Mormon is even easier. It's easy to win the argument. But no matter what you show that Jehovah's Witness, they're spying on each other to begin with. There's a fear element. All cults use fear. All false religion uses fear, including Roman Catholicism. But they won't believe it. Intellectually, they can't deny what you're saying. Rationally, they know what you're telling them is the truth. They can't deny the facts. But they continue of their own volition to persist in believing something that is demonstrably false. That's cults. You can show Roman Catholic people, look at Cardinal Mahoney, 660 million plus legal fees to keep him out of prison. Thousands of children molested in Los Angeles County. Thousands. And you were protecting these sex criminals instead of the children? Oh, it's the one true church. Wait a minute, it says in the epistle to Timothy that forbidding marriage is a doctrine of demons. They can't deny it, but they'll still continue Nomine patri cum filio cum spiritu santo. Why? I once witnessed to an ultra orthodox rabbi in the Upper West Side of my native New York. They were giving out questionnaires to see how much you knew about Judaism, and I answered all the questions right, and it said you should be a rabbi. So I talked to him, and he was pretty impressed I could speak Hebrew. So I talked to him, and I told him what I believed, and he got angry. Same thing happened to me in Palm Springs uh, with the Lubavitch rabbi in Palm Springs, got really angry. So I said, look at Daniel 9. The Messiah had to come and die before the second temple would be destroyed. Do you believe that Daniel is a Hebrew prophet? Yes. Well then, if the Messiah had to come and die before 70 AD, who was he? He said, give me a better source than Daniel. You want me to give you a better source than the Word of God? If there was a better source than the Word of God, Hashem wouldn't be Hashem. He wouldn't be God. He couldn't deny what I was saying, but he couldn't deal with it. I've gone through this with Orthodox Jews, with Roman Catholics, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, with Muslims in England all the time. Muhammad was a prophet. When Muhammad was 54 years old, he took Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakir, and married her when she was six years old. According to the Hadith, he consummated the marriage when she was nine. A man nearly 60 years of age, having sexual relations with a nine-year-old girl? He's your prophet? How can you deny this? I can show you in the Hadith. They tried to deny it, and I said, no, it's in the Hadith. Then she said, oh, her father approved. So because the father approves for his child to be raped, that's okay, right? Couldn't deny it. They couldn't deny it. But don't confuse me with the facts. My mind is made up. This is one false religion, one cult after another does this. That's not my problem. That's their problem. I can pray for them, I can witness to them, I can tell them the truth, but that's their problem. What happens when born-again believers, people who profess to have a saving faith in Jesus, behave the same way? You show them the religious con artistry of the televangelists. You show them the deception of the ecumenical movement. You show them the paganistic origin of the emergent church. You show them what Brian McLaren is really doing. They don't want to know. They do the same thing. Turn with me, please. The first John, chapter four. Can we get the first frame, please, on the PowerPoint? Thank you. Spirit of truth, spirit of error. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Notice discernment and testing things biblically. It's not an option. It is a command of God. 
If you are not discerning, you are not following the direct commands of God. It's imperative. I suggest you do this. No, he commands we test. He commands we test on the basis of his word. Oh, you're being critical. You're being judgmental. No, I'm being biblical. You're being ignorant, undiscerning, and carnal. You're just too ignorant to know it because that's what you've been taught. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And he's warning Christians here. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. In its era, in its system, Laban, it was speaking to an incipient Gnosticism. But every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard that it is coming and now is already in the world. Whenever you find a false prophet trying to get into the church, they will in some way have an aberrational Christology. They will believe something false about Jesus. In the Messianic movement, we have people who are essentially Ebionites. They think he was the Messiah, not God. There are people like that. Roman Catholicism thinks he returns physically under the appearances of bread and wine, a transubstantiated Eucharist. Liberal Protestantism teaches he's simply a moral teacher, an enlightened one for his age or time, or something like that. Mormons, again, the spirit brother of Satan. Jehovah's Witnesses, Latter-day Aryans. He's simply an angelic being, Michael the Archangel, an archangel. False prophets will ultimately have an aberrational Christology. They will believe something false about the Lord Jesus. They'll deny the triunity of the Godhead. They'll deny his deity. They'll have some false belief about him. That Satan got the victory on the cross instead of Jesus, the way Kenneth Copeland taught, Joyce Meyer affirmed in her first book, well, let's look. Continues. Every spirit that does not confess to you, this is not from God, this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. That is the apostles' teaching. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth from the spirit of error. The spirit of truth always has to do with Jesus. He is the way, the truth, the life. It has to do with Christ. The spirit of truth has to do with Christ. The spirit of error has to do with anti-Christ. Now, we have to understand the nature of Antichrist. In the Greek language, Antichriston, it has three meanings. One, it means that which is in place of Christ, not simply that which is against. It means in place of. They've got a different Jesus in place of the biblical one. There are many Antichrists, and then there are these two spirits, uh, these two beings that are coming in Revelation chapter 11 at the end of the age. Okay, the Antichrist, we call them the Antichrist and the false prophet. Revelation 13 does not call them that, but that's what they are. So there are many Antichrists, many of them. It's a spirit that's always been in the world. The spirit of Antichrist has always been in the world. It's closely associated with something called the mystery of iniquity. And then ultimately, it's these two beasts who will personify all of it. Almost a satanic counterfeit of the incarnation of Jesus. The spirit of error points people to Antichrist as the spirit of Jesus is the spirit of truth. That is the Holy Spirit who points people to Christ. Okay. Those who are of God listen to the Holy Spirit. Those who are not of God will be deceived by the spirit of Antichrist. Something else will be in place of, their, of a biblical faith in Christ. That's the way it works. Next frame, please. Let's understand how this works. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 14, verses 16 to 17.
I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter, that is the paracletos in Greek, the Holy Spirit, that he may be with you. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Notice the one who helps us is not the spirit of error, it's the spirit of truth. Now, I've heard people out of either ignorance or the fact that they were deceivers with an agenda say, oh, Jesus prayed we would be one in his high priestly prayer. We have to be one so the world will believe. If they're going to quote scripture, I suggest they read it. In the high priestly prayer in John 17, verse 17, Jesus prefaced the high priestly prayer, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. In other words, Jesus taught plainly and directly, you cannot have unity of the Holy Spirit where there is fundamental doctrinal error. If people have fundamental doctrinal error, particularly a fundamentally wrong belief about Jesus, there is no basis for unity of the Spirit because they don't have His Spirit, they're not of His Spirit, they're of the Spirit of error. We cannot be united with Mormonism. I don't care what Craig Blomberg from Western Seminary says. I don't care what Craig Hazen from Biola says. And even Ravi Zacharias, a man I once respected, is playing footsies with them. We can have no common ground with Mormons. Any ex-Mormons in here? Ask them. They will tell you. We can have no common ground with the Church of Rome. For all of their faults and mistakes, the reformers, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Aquampadius, all of every one of them was a Roman Catholic priest who got saved, or who at least read the scriptures and came to an understanding that the church that they grew up in and where they were members of the clergy was false. Luther learned from a French humanist scholar, Le Fibure, that the word metanoia in Greek does not mean penance as in the Roman Catholic confession, sacrament of penance, but it meant to repent. The lights went on. Not only that, the reformers were from the intelligentsia of the Roman Catholic clergy. They were humanist scholars. Every one of them was a Roman Catholic priest. Oh, you're a bigot, you're a Protestant. I'm not a Protestant or a Catholic. I'm just a believer in Jesus. But I do point out the fact that the Protestant reformers were themselves Roman Catholic clergy, highly educated Roman Catholic clergy who saw the truth. If you were to read Fox's Book of Martyrs or the Martyr's Mirror, do you know what most believers were burned alive for in the 16th century by the Roman Church? For refusing to worship bread and wine. They chose the stake instead. That's a different Jesus. Oh, we have to be one! You can only be one with those who have the truth, not those who have a different gospel, a different basis of biblical authority, a different standard of morality. And so we look at John 14, look what we see. The first characteristic we see is he's the spirit of truth. The spirit of antichrist is the spirit of error. Pay attention. The way the Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church for the coming of Christ, for the second coming of Christ. The way the Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church for the coming of Christ. The spirit of Antichrist is preparing the harlot church for the coming of the Antichrist. You understand? The same as the Holy Spirit is preparing us for the return of Jesus, the spirit of Antichrist is preparing them for deception. And they're deceived already. Secondly, God's truth does not change. The way the spirit of error works, the way the spirit of Antichrist works, is through something a philosopher or a theologian would call the zeitgeist. The zeitgeist. The spirit of the age. When the church first went off after the time of Constantine, the zeitgeist was Platonic philosophy. Along comes Augustine of Hippo. He rewrites Christianity as a Platonic religion. In the Renaissance, the spirit of the age is Aristotelianism. A rabbi named Rambam, Moses Maimonides, rewrites Judaism as an Aristotelian religion. Well, so too 
Thomas Aquinas comes and rewrites Christianity as an Aristotelian religion. At the end of the 19th, early 20th century, the zeitgeist is 19th century German rationalism. Along comes liberal higher criticism, liberal theology out of Tübingen, Germany, and so forth. What is the zeitgeist now? Postmodernism. A lack of absolutes. Everything is relativistic. What's happening? You've got Brian McLaren, Rick Warren. They're rewriting Christianity as a postmodern religion. It's not about truth, it's about relationship. It's about what works for me. It's all subjective. It's based on feelings, not sensuality. So McLaren can say, we should declare a five-year moratorium on debating same-sex marriage. And if we haven't decided in five years, we should have another five-year moratorium. Then the church should decide. Well, if God has already decided as Adam and Eve, how can the church decide it's going to be Adam and Steve? Do you understand what these people are saying? They're saying the church wrote the Bible. The church can rewrite it. It's not the word of God. Well, the scripture says, in the beginning was the word. The scriptures is Jesus in print. They've got a different Jesus in place of Jesus. It is antichrist. It is controlled by the spirit of antichrist. It is the zeitgeist. The world rejects the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in John 14, the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit because he's the spirit of truth. The world prefers to believe a lie. So does the worldly church. They believe the lie. How can anybody in their right mind think a tattooed goon, a criminally convicted pedophile who kicks old ladies in the face, who leaves his wife and kids and takes off with a babe to Hawaii, then he's com coming back to be restored to the ministry? Who in their right mind could believe this? Do you understand what's happening? Jesus promises us the power of sound mind. These people have lost their mind. It's only one of two possibilities. Either you're a new believer who doesn't know any better, or you've lost your mind. Nobody in their right mind could believe these things. Now, if you've been deceived and you love the Lord, the Holy Spirit will show you this is wrong. Many of us have been in all kinds of deception. I know people who got saved in the Roman church, and I got saved in a cult called the Children of God. But if you love Jesus, even though you may be in error and deception, if you love him, he will show you by the spirit of truth that that's false. How many people here used to be in loony churches with, fault, with doctrines now you know now were false and you came out of it? Put your hand up. Look around. In England, it would be at least 50%. Here, it's about one-third. That's right. They've lost their mind. The world will believe it. So will a worldly church. The spirit of truth points people to Christ. The spirit of error will point to Antichrist. There are three kinds of people in God's economy. Jews, Gentiles, and believers who can be either Jew or Gentile. The devil already has Israel deceived. They're blinded not to recognize their own Messiah. The nations are deceived. That leaves the church. He's deceiving the church. And I just don't mean the nominal church, the liberal church, the Roman church. I mean people who claim to be saved. They're already being taken in by the spirit of Antichrist. But there's something much more frightening. There's an aspect of this that once we understand it biblically, it's absolutely terrifying. Think of that Jehovah's Witness. You show them, you prove it. These guys are crazy. You said the world would end in 1914, the world would end in 1915, the world would end in 1920. You're following proven false prophets, even according to your own literature. I've shown them watchtowers saying that people who predict things that don't happen are false prophets, and I showed them other watchtowers showing their own leaders were false prophets. They couldn't deny it. 
I've done the same with Mormons. I've done the same with many people. Once again, don't confuse me with the facts my mind is made up. They choose to believe a lie. They can't see it. Emphasize, can't. This is the spirit of error. They can't believe because God has now blinded them. These things you see in Toronto, Pensacola, Lakeland, the tele-evangelist, the ecumenical movement, these things are not simply deceptions. They are judgments. God gives them over in judgment. I will make you believe that lie because you reject the truth. Let's see how this works. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 12. Verse 37, but though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. The late John Wimber and the Vineyard Movement taught that signs and wonders are the key to belief. Jesus said in John 10, for which one of these signs do you stone me? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing the word of God. Biblically, these signs follow. Jesus never allowed signs, wonders, miracles, healings, the same benefla oat we say in Hebrew. He never allowed those things to be the focus of his message or his ministry. When Jesus healed people, it was usually, shh, don't tell anybody. That's between us. Go your way, sin no more. Jesus had healings, but he never had a healing crusade. He had miracles, but he never had a miracle crusade. He had a repentance crusade. These signs follow. It is always a false prophet who will have a healing crusade, a miracle crusade. Only their healings and miracles are usually bogus anyway, and sometimes even demonic. What did Jesus say? A wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. You see people flocking to stadiums and arenas for this stuff? You see them flocking to stadiums and arenas, and you know what they do? They're all falling over and all this stuff. This bit, you know. What did Jesus say that was? Not Jacob, Jesus. He said, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. That's a wicked and an adulterous generation. The only thing Jesus would have had to do was put on a show for Herod, and Herod would have intervened that he would not have been crucified. He refused. Although John did no miracle, when John preached Jesus, many believed. Faith cometh by hearing. This is not to demean the place of signs and wonders understood and practiced biblically. It's just that most of what we see today is not biblical. In fact, most of what we see today is not even real. And so it goes in John 12. Although they saw these things, they did not believe. They would not believe. Verse 38, that the word of Ishayahu Hanavi, Isaiah the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Ishayahu Nun Gimel, Isaiah 53. Okay. For this cause, they could not believe. For Isaiah again said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and perceive with their hearts, and turn to me, or be converted, and I heal them. Notice the progression. They would not believe, they could not believe, they should not believe. Here's the door. Who is it? It's me, Jesus. I won't open. Who is it? It's me, Jesus. We need to get this straightened out. No. Who is it? Me, Jesus. Would not, could not. He locks the door. Now you can't believe. Now you can't repent. Now he gives them over to it. It's not just deception, it is judgment. Look with me to Romans chapter 1, please. Speaking of 
homosexuality and lesbianism in verse 26. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural, the whole Ellen DeGeneres thing. In the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the dual penalty of their error. Again, don't get me wrong, I was a cocaine addict. I have friends dead of drugs. Only by the grace of God, I wasn't one of them. I was more crazy than some of my friends. For this reason, God gave them over. You want to be deceived? I'll deceive you. You want to believe a lie? I'll make you believe a lie. You've seen the truth. You were told the truth. You recognized the truth. I convicted you with my spirit, but you hardened your heart. You would not. You could not. Now you shall not because you can't. He gives them over to it. Turn with me, please, to the Old Testament. First Kings, chapter 22. Verse 13. Then the messengers who went to summon Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Behold, now the word of the prophets are uniformly favorable to the king. Please let your word be like the word of one of them, and speak favorably. But Micaiah, that is, he was like unto Yahweh, said, As the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that I will speak. God does nothing without revealing it to his true prophets. When he came to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramat Gilead to battle, or shall we refrain? And he answered, go up and succeed. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. You want to believe a lie? I'll tell you one, in other words. Then the king said to him, how many times must I adjure you to speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? You see, there was something in this wicked king who knew that Micaiah was telling the truth and his false prophets were tickling the ears. False prophets will always tell you what you want to hear. True prophets will tell you what you need to hear. False prophets will be driven with a financial incentive. True prophets don't want the job. Who wants to be rejected, possibly stoned? They don't even want the job. Read Amos. Only a false prophet wants to be one. So he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains, in verse 17, like sheep which have no shepherd. Hebrew word for shepherd and pastor is the same word, ro'e. Well, we don't have many shepherds today. Plenty of hirelings. Plenty of people who are in pastoral ministry for sordid gain. But not many shepherds. I'm proud to say, and I'm happy to say, and I don't say this to flatter him, Walter is a shepherd. Marco is a shepherd. They're only in it because Jesus called them to feed his sheep. Most people in ministry today are hirelings. It's their job. Jesus tells us how to distinguish between a pastor and a hireling. How? Because the shepherd will protect the sheep from the wolves. A hireling will not. He'll market anything that sells. The Lord said, these have no master. Let each of them return to his house in peace. Then the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, Jehovah is judge. Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? And Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramat Gilead? One said this, while another said that. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I'll entice him. And the Lord said to him, how? And he said, I'll go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Then he said, you are to entice him. Go and prevail. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of these your prophets. The Lord has proclaimed disaster against you. You want to follow false prophets? Oh, I'll send you false prophets. Not only will I send you false prophets, I'll make you believe them. You want Benny and Kenny? Go ahead, have Benny and Kenny. I'll give you over to Benny and Kenny. Don't forget to bring your checkbook. You need it. But 
the Lord will put a lying spirit in the mouth of your prophets. He will make you believe it. This is scary. But eschatologically, it becomes not just frightening. In fact, eschatologically, it becomes absolutely terrifying. Look with me, please, to 2 Thessalonians where David Hawking left off. It's talking about the Antichrist and false prophet, the man of lawlessness, the anthropon enomon. Verse 10, and with all deception of wickedness, they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Now understand the word saved here does not mean unsaved people who are not saved. Salvation has three aspects, past, present, and future. In the past, it's we were saved. When you were first born again, you were justified. We are being saved. We are being sanctified. We shall be saved. We shall be redeemed. He who perseveres to the end shall be saved. Lift up your head. Your redemption draws near. It's not talking here about unsaved people getting saved. It's not talking about that. It's talking about redemption. The Holy Spirit is the pledge or earnest when somebody is truly born again and repents of their sins and accepts Jesus, they receive the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus comes back, he sees who has it and picks up his parcel. And the Antichrist will pick up his. For this reason, in verse 11, God will send upon them a deluding influence so they might believe what is false in order that they may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. When people reject the truth of God's word, it is because they are taking pleasure in wickedness in some way. When people see the truth, they're shown the truth, they understand, they cannot deny it's the truth, but they still persist in believing something that's false, it's because they're taking pleasure in wickedness in some way. When somebody goes off morally, they have to try to find a way to justify it. You realize that the divorce rate amongst Christians is as high as the secular world in California? When I was first saved, less than 40 years ago, the only born-again Christians I know who were divorced, it happened either before they were saved or they got saved and their unbelieving husband and their unbelieving wife left them. The idea of two saved Christians getting divorced and remarried was unheard of. I didn't know any. I didn't know anybody who knew any. Maybe you got saved and the unbelieving husband or wife left you. That could be, and you got married again or something like that, or it may have been before you were a Christian, but two saved Christians getting divorced. And now you've got preachers doing it. They take pleasure in wickedness, so they have to find a way to try to justify it. Same with homosexuality. You have evangelicals now trying to justify it. Certainly in England, but also now in America. Well, let's look at this. The Lord will send a deluding influence to make them believe what is false. You want false prophets? Oh, I'll send you a false prophet. You want to follow deception? Oh, I'll send you a deceiver. That's Romans 1. That's 1 Kings 22. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's John 12. That's many places. You want to reject the truth and follow deception, the Lord will give you over to it in judgment. You're not just judged for the sin and the rebellion, you will be judged by it. We have people here today who are into these money preaching televangelists, people into ecumenical churches. You stay in those places, you put yourself in a very precarious position. You're here today hearing the truth from the speakers at this conference. Not just me, for a reason. He will give them over. Now you can't believe. Once somebody's been in the Jehovah's Witnesses more than a year, it's almost impossible to see them get saved. Now it happens, God can do it. But statistically, it's very unlikely. Why is it that that Catholic person can't see? Many of you have Catholic family who can't see. I have both Catholic and Jewish family that can't see because they would not see. Wouldn't see. People in cults, people in Islam, false religions. But what happens when it 
comes into the so-called body of Christ. Are those people really saved to begin with in some cases? We have to ask that question. Would not, could not, should not. Now you can't believe. I will make you believe that lie. I will give you over to that deception. The reason there's nothing you're going to say to them that's going to get through to them is because God has hardened their heart. Now, God does not do this arbitrarily like the Calvinists teach. Calvinism is false. When God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it was because he persistently hardened his own. Then God hardened his heart. If you read the book of Numbers carefully, it was not until he persistently and consistently hardened his own, then God hardened his heart. Let us see to it that we do not harden ours. These things are not just deceptions. They are judgments. The world is being set up to follow the Antichrist. They're being set up. If you cannot see through obvious false prophets like Benny and Kenny, if you cannot see through an obvious false teacher like Joyce with the earrings, what is going to happen when real deception comes? If you can't see through these people, what's going to happen when real deceivers come? Just think of Judas, he's the son of perdition. Who else is called the son of perdition? <laughs> Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Even the apostles didn't know unless Jesus revealed him. There's many antichrists. It's a spirit of antichrist. It's already operating in the church. Not just the world. The worldly church. The church has become so much like the world so often that even the world makes fun of it. But let's look. What can you do when somebody has the spirit of error, when God gives them over? Well, apart from pray for them, nothing. There is nothing you or I are going to tell somebody who God has given over to deception that's going to change their mind. Nothing. If God has hardened their heart, there's nothing we can do except pray. Well, is there any hope? Well, there is. But only one place in Scripture does it say there is. When the Torah is read, Israel is blind. God has blinded Israel to the meaning of the Torah. They can't see it's about Yeshua, about the Messiah. They can't see it. God has blinded them. But in Romans 11 we read, that veil will be removed one day. The first Christians were Jews. The last Christians will be Jews, whether John Piper likes it or not whether Rick Godwin likes it or not. But look under what circumstances. They will look upon him who they have pierced and mourn as one mourns for an only son. When? In the great tribulation when two-thirds of them get wiped out. My son was in the Israeli army. He got out two months ago. He was in two wars already. It's terrible. They have no peace in their own land in and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Only in the hour of desperation, when the lie of Talmudic Judaism fails them, will they turn to their Messiah. Only a disaster, a calamity, when their backs are up against the wall and they think all is lost, will they in desperation open up to the truth. When somebody has a spirit of error, when God has handed somebody over, the only time you're going to see them change is when God softens that heart again. And that only happens when the lie they have believed fails them. I don't care if it's the lie of Talmudic Judaism, the lie of Islam, the lie of Roman Catholicism, the lie of Islam, the lie of Jehovah's Witness or Mormons, the lie of secular humanism, the lie of the emergent church, or the lie of the gospel of health and wealth of the televangelists. The lie will fail them. Calamity must come upon them to know they believe the lie if there's any hope for them at all. But look at the Jews. Two-thirds of them get whacked anyway. God gives them over. It is a terrifying thing 
to fall into the hands of the living God. That is what is happening. If you don't have discernment, you're not going to be deceived. You're deceived already. If you imagine that you can be in the will of God and remain in the Roman church, you're deceived already. If you believe that you can be in the will of God and be in the emergent church, you're deceived already. If you're being sucked in by these money-preaching tele-evangelists with a different gospel, you are deceived already. You are not going to be deceived. You are deceived. This is the spirit of error. The longer somebody stays in it, the more difficult it is to get out. Please, in the name of God, I beseech you by the mercies of Jesus, get out now and take as many out with you as you possibly can. God gives them over. These things are not simply deceptions. They are judgments. However, going back to our basic text in 1 John 4, we read some other things. Yes, these terrible things, they're undeniably true. But we're also told, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. You understand, if I didn't love people, I wouldn't care what they believe. If I didn't love the people who were being sucked in by the tele-evangelists, I couldn't care less what they believed. If I didn't love unsaved Jews, it wouldn't matter to me that they reject their Messiah. If I didn't love Catholic people, I wouldn't care less that they think they're going to atone for their own sin in purgatory. I love. God's love. We're told... For us, he has something much better. Much better. We're not designed to commit to his judgment. We're not designed for his wrath. We're not designed to be captivated by the deceptions of the spirit of Antichrist. It should not happen to any of us. It doesn't have to happen to any of us. And if we abide faithfully in Jesus, it won't happen to you.